Welcome everyone to this event on trade unions, worker rights and the media, which is jointly organised by the Media Reform Coalition and Media North as part of the Festival of Debate. I'm Debs Grayson, I'm Campaigns Coordinator for B the BBC and Beyond, Reimagining Public Media. This is a new campaign from the Media Reform Coalition to try and reimagine what public media could or should be in the digital age. This event is part of a series which will be feeding into a manifesto for a people's media that we'll be writing later this year. We have additional events coming up next week on community media and media in protest, and you can find details of those on our website and on MRC social media. Um, I'm just going to open by saying a little bit about the BBC and Beyond campaign before handing over to Granville Williams from Media North, who's going to be chairing tonight's event. Um, so this is a campaign about reimagining public media and what we mean by public media are institutions which act in the public interest rather than the interests of politicians, wealthy owners or powerful businesses. In some ways, it's an aspiration. We think that public media should be independent, able to hold powerful interests to account. We think they should be accountable, facing consequences when they do harm and democratic, participatory and representative of diverse lives and for everybody, serving everyone's needs and accessible to all. We all know that most of the media we have today are very far from this ideal. In theory, these are principles which are very close to those of our public broadcasters, the BBC and Channel 4. I'm sure a lot of the discussion today will look at how well these institutions actually live out these ideals and how they could be changed for the better. Um, probably in our current context, the institutions which most closely live out these principles of public media are smaller independent media outlets, media cooperatives and democratically run community media. And I hope that this kind of media will also be part of tonight's discussion. As I said, we will be writing a manifesto for people's media later this year. If you have ideas for this manifesto, how you think it should be changed in relation to how it, it covers trade unions and worker rights or anything else, you can contribute those ideas in the chat on whatever platform you're looking on. Um, or you can also go to the BBC and Beyond website and there will be a link to um, the contact form on there at the end of this event. Um, so now I'm going to pass you over to Granville and our fantastic panel of speakers. Okay. Are we ready to go? Right, can I first of all welcome everybody to this timely and topical event on trade unions, the media, workers' rights. In the past few weeks, we've seen trade unions at the center even of global attention through the actions of Amazon workers in Bessemer, Alabama. And it was truly amazing to see how this was reported. But also closer to home in Manchester, we've seen 400 bus workers on strike against what's now a very pernicious tactic by uh, the employers, which is to fire and rehire. Similarly, we've also seen examples over the last year with this pandemic of how vulnerable huge sections of our working population are to insecure work, insecure hours, zero contracts, but they're vulnerable because they've been at the center of the pandemic. They've had to work. They've not had the freedom of choice to furlough. They've had to work. And so I think, as I say, this is a timely and topical event. And I'm really pleased that we've got some expert speakers to help us to do this work. So let me first of all briefly introduce, we've got Nick Jones, formerly a veteran industrial correspondent, uh, who's written extensively for the publications that I edit, Media North, um, and also written extensively in books and other articles about these issues. So welcome, Nick. Secondly, we have Sarah Woolley. Sarah, I've known now probably for about four or five years because Sarah always used to support my resolutions at the Yorkshire number side TUC. And I'm grateful for that because she always gave a good, fresh perspective 
on what was going on. And then finally, uh, Jim Bamella. And I hope Jim doesn't remind me, uh, I, in one article I wrote recently, I had to dig out a dispute you remember from a long time ago, Jim, the Pergamon dis uh, dispute, which lasted, I think, two years, didn't it? Something like that anyway, so you maybe want to talk to that. So what I'm going to do now is to hand over to Nick so that he can now begin to talk about the issues that he thinks are high, that we need to highlight at the moment. Thank, thank you, uh, Granville. And as you said, I'm a former Labour correspondent and I spent many, many years um, reporting industrial affairs and employment issues for the BBC. And I'd like to start, if I may, on a positive point, because I've been really encouraged um, by the way that um, television and radio and especially the press have been responding um, to the challenges that are facing um, that group of workers you talked about, those casual workers, those people on zero hours, flexible shifts and the like. Uh, now we'll have the first slide. Yep. Uh, the next one, please, Tom. Thank you. Now then, recently, the news media has been taking a great deal of interest um, in the campaigns for better working hours and employment rights especially. And what we're seeing is more stories being written about, for example, the plight of um, the private uh, hire car drivers uh, who work for Uber, uh, for the takeaway couriers who work for Deliveroo, as well as the catering workers and the cleaners. And now most of those people in what we call the gig economy, they lack, of course, as we know, contracts of employment. Uh, so they don't get that regular protection, which the regular uh, workforce gets. Now we'll have slide number two. Now, there have been some successes, including victory in the Supreme Court uh, for the Uber drivers. Uh, and it's a ruling that perhaps is a first step, a, a potential first step in providing a foundation for a more secure future for some of these flexible workers. Now, for me, seeing this upsurge in interest uh, in the plight of uh, workers like this is like a trip down memory lane, because in the late 1980s, I did regular reports for BBC Radio and news bulletins and programmes on what were then largely futile efforts by the trade unions to win recognition for the increasing number of young people who were being employed in the catering industry in newly opened hamburger and pizza chains. Now we're going to see uh, image number three. I did features at the time uh, on the way school leavers uh, were being exploited. Now, this is the front cover of The Listener in May 1986, and the headline says it all, fast food and the throwaway jobs. Now, The Listener was a much admired uh, uh, magazine. It's one of the casualties of many of the BBC cuts. Now, much of my reporting at the time focused on the conduct of people like McDonald's, Wimpy's and Pizza Land and the hurdles that was facing unions like the GMB, the transport workers, Usdor, the Bakers Union, and they were all struggling to win trade union recognition. Now, the late 80s, of course, were a time of great upheaval in the labour market. Deregulation and new employment laws were beginning to bite. They'd all been introduced by Mrs Thatcher. Just one of the statistics from the time, half a million young people aged under 21 were removed entirely from wage protection. They'd previously been uh, guaranteed uh, a rate of pay under the former Wages Council. Now, in more recent years, I wrote pieces for uh, suggesting that the TUC itself should perhaps have taken the initiative. It should have somehow intervened and offered all of these young workers some form of introductory free union membership, some sort of introductory offer. Now, for understandable reasons, it was an idea that didn't go down well uh, with the established unions, because, of course, they were pursuing their own independent campaigns. And uh, against a, a background of rapidly declining membership, each union was then trying, against the odds, to get bargaining rights. Now, into 
union rivalry has in some ways been a strength of the uh, British union movement. But we have seen that large groups of unorganized, low paid casual workers have often been left to their own devices. Next slide, please. Now, in recent years, we've seen the formation of several unions outside the TUC structure. Uh, this is the Independent Workers Union. Now, they were established in 2012 to represent mainly low paid uh, migrant workers, such as outsourced cleaners and security guards. Another newcomer is the United Voices of the World, founded in 2014, which describes itself as a grassroots organization for low paid migrant and precarious workers. Next slide, please. Now, the app drivers and couriers union, they have gone from strength to strength because they pursued a legal uh, a landmark legal action, uh, which began in 2015 and has only just recently resulted in victory for them at the Supreme Court. Now, two private former private hire uh, drivers we see here, uh, it was their case. They were the lead um, claimants in the case, and they pursued this case jointly with the GMB union and it led the Supreme Court to rule uh, and it awarded the private hire drivers the right to get a minimum wage and holiday pay. Now these two unions, that's the app workers and the GMP, they are fighting of course a new fight to ensure, um, to try to ensure that that ruling is observed by the companies because it isn't actually being uh, observed at the moment in full. Now next slide please. It was the potential consequences, of course, of that Uber ruling uh, that disrupted the stock market flotation of Deliveroo. And you probably remember reading about it. And of course, look, there it is. Company values drops in workers' rights backlash. And it was all about the um, investors worrying that Deliveroo would never make any money uh, because improved workers' rights might actually cut the profit. Now, there's no doubt these challenges to the gig economy me, are of great public interest. Trying to earn a living on the frontiers of technological change has, I think, captured the imagination and the interest of journalists. And for once in a very, very long time, workers' rights and employment issues are getting much more attention. Final slide, please. Now, these new startup unions are the beneficiaries um, of this media interest. Their profile is much higher. Uh, the independence and freewheeling nature of the gig economy, it's undoubtedly attracting a degree of sympathetic coverage in the press. Now, I realize this is especially galling for the established unions. The UK's dominant conservative supporting press rarely offers coverage um, uh, uh, about what their columnists and commentators argue is a union movement in their misguided opinion that uh, exists uh, to bolster the Labour Party. And it's that sort of misrepresentation um, which is working to the advantage of these independent unions. Now, being outside the TUC does help these startup unions capture the attention of the media, but it raises this very, very important question. Um, uh, and it's a question about the wider collective strength of the trade union movement and how that's going to be galvanized. How should it be galvanized? At this time, when there are so many workers, as Granville rightly says, who face even greater insecurity because of, COVID, because of COVID and the pandemic, climate change, and all that's happening as a result of Brexit. So I want to leave on a positive note, but to say that positive note does raise some really serious challenges about the future. Really good that. Thanks ever so much, Nick. Um, there's going to be some issues, I think, raised by that. Uh, I think very important issues about that relationship between the established trade union movement and what might be seen by them as these upstarts that are getting all the coverage. So thank you for that. I want to move on now to Sarah Woolley. Sarah is the General Secretary of the Bakers Union. And uh, Sarah, over the years, has earned a very strong reputation of championing the lower paid. So that the work that the Baker's Union and Sarah has done, for example, around the McDonald's 15 pound an hour, around the Sheffield needs a pay rise, and also now uh, 
my union, the NUJ, I'm based in Leeds. I'm a member of Leeds Wakefield branch. We're now actively supporting a Leeds needs a pay rise. So um, Sarah really got high profile now. I see you everywhere, Sarah, speaking on this and that. So I'm really pleased that you could find the time to come and speak at this event. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Granville, and, and thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening and contribute to this important debate. And you were right, it is timely, um, and it is right that we have this conversation now. More so as we look to come out of the pandemic and not return to this pre-pandemic norm, um, we have got an opportunity to change. And I, I, I don't want to really use the, the, the phrase build back better, but build back better for us um, as, as, as a class. I've, I've spent a large amount of time thinking about what kind of media do we need to support workplace struggles today um, and how historically we've got the word out, so to speak, about actions our members are taking. Um, I'm by no means an expert um, uh, of media, but I can speak about our experiences. Um, we live in a world where news is at our fingertips at all times now, from waking up on a morning and checking social media, the, there's apps on our phones, television, radio, even when you turn your laptop on and, and search for something, the, the chosen headlines are there for you to see. That's very different to what it was like when um, even 10 years ago, where people relied in the main of the, the daily newspaper and the morning and evening news to find out, as my dad used to say, what's going on in the world. News is everywhere, yet the voices of workers is not being heard. And, and, and Nick's just mentioned, um, amongst other things, Uber drivers, and, and I'll touch on that shortly. But the, re the, the reality of working in the food industry, for example, through the pandemic is not being magnified past a, a few local newspapers and, and left wing newspapers like, say, the Morning Star. And, and that is a little unfair when we when the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union launched our Right to Food report a couple of weeks ago. Um, we did get an article in The Guardian, um, but it didn't really get anywhere near the noise that it should have done, especially when the findings were showing things like 40% of food workers have eaten less than they should through the pandemic due to a lack of money, and that one in five had actually run out of food because of a lack of cash. And yes, I'm biased, you know, I'm the General Secretary of the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union and it's their, our member stories that are in that report. But in the sixth richest country in the world, the fact that the very people producing the food to feed the nation, not being able to feed themselves and their families is disgraceful. And, and the radio silence in the media around it, even more so. Um, We've seen over the last 12 months that the, the right wing media have, have been attacking workers where outbreaks have happened, um, COVID outbreaks have happened. We experienced this at a site in Northampton where our low paid members were blamed for the outbreak because they were car sharing and, and sharing accommodation. The local news seemed to listen to what the, the bosses were saying and none of them said to the mentioned to the employer about why these people were, were sharing houses and sharing cars. You know, they didn't raise why they couldn't afford their own accommodation or, or vehicles. Nobody asked them why they didn't put transport on in a global pandemic so that they could get to work at stupid o'clock in the morning or why they weren't sticking to the workplace bubbles instead of moving people around the site, mixing people up. And because of things like that, it's very easy then for our members to ask us as a union why we would want to work with the media when their experiences certainly in that case, weren't generally great when they got involved. Um, and, and they've asked why we don't just rely on social media and our website to get the message out. And, and the reality is social media can be fantastic, you know, but it also can be an echo chamber. And we know that we need media outlets to amplify, amplify our messages further than our followers um, on, say, Twitter can reach. And I have to say, without the media, um, our, our strike campaign back in 2017 wouldn't have gained anywhere near the traction or made such a, an impact within McDonald's that it did. I remember the first strike, I was there, it, the, the, it was all over everywhere. We got on the news, it was in the newspapers, it was on the radios, it, because it was historical. And I think we'd almost got this joint focus on targeting this, this huge international corporate giant, us as a trade union and the media across the board collectively. 
which is what I think is happening now with the likes of Uber. We've, we've kind of got a baddie that we can focus on and, and the media have jumped on that as well. Um, so where history is being made, all the areas of the media get involved, right wing as, as, as well as middle and left wing. But when, when workers need their voice amplifying elsewhere, you know, not against big corporate giants like McDonald's, it's only seemingly the left-leaning media that tend to pick it up, meaning that profile then and the voice is limited. Um, and I think, and I say this obviously not as a journalist, but I'm, I'm, I'm acutely aware of the cutbacks to the profession over the years. I've seen firsthand the reduction of my local newspaper and the move to more social media and web-based news, um, certainly in, in Wakefield. And that's why I, I, I supported many of Granville's motions at, at Yorkshire and Umber TUC conferences. Um, and I think we need to make a concerted effort uh, as a trade union to form links locally with, with NUJ reps and activists, as do other trade unions, to give our members a decent local voice in their communities. So that when action is being taken, for example, against zero hours contracts or exploitative bosses, the local community understands why that action is being taken and supports that action rather than not knowing what it's all about and effectively walking past, siding with the employer who's, who's got a lot louder voice because they've got more money. But also we need to do that nationally as well. And we, al we also need to understand um, better the challenges that, that you guys as journalists are facing. I sit on the trade union coordinating group, as does the, the, N the NUJ. And honestly, some of the reports that the NUJ representatives give on how journalists are being treated is horrific, but we don't hear enough about that. Um, I'm not sure I've answered the brief, but I think going forward, certainly from our point of view as a trade union, we need to build up links with journalists that understand the work that we do so that together we break through the noise of the right wing media, which seems to be intent on dividing us and utilising social media platforms to amplify that message further but certainly on a local basis, working together as trade unions to bring the community we're working in together on issues that impact everyone. Because where that happens, like in Sheffield, with Sheffield needs a pay rise, change is happening, fantastic change is happening, and support is building and workers' voices are getting through. And just as a final thought, Deb's mentioned public media in the introduction, and that really struck a chord with me. As a union, we have, we have a position that everything should be in public ownership, and why should the media be any different? So perhaps we should be looking at an alternative publicly owned media, locally and nationally, um, forming news cooperatives that aren't beholden to the, to the Murdochs of the world, but decide democratically what they will report on and work with community organisations and trade unions and workers to really make sure our voices and struggles are heard and get through the noise of everything else. Um, and I'll leave it there, Granville. Thank you. That's great. Thanks ever so much, Sarah. Again, you've raised some important points. I mean, uh, the, the issue of the local regional media and their, their role, how you can make those contacts with the NUJ members, that's great. And the other thing that also needs to be brought into the frame is how we build up alternative. If, if, if these papers in some areas of the country, newspapers have died, they're, they're, they're in what we call news deserts. So how do we, how do we get alternative news as well as how do we deal with these big structures like the BBC, Channel 4, and how we can try and get our message across there. Just want to make one very quick point. The one good uh, documentary I saw recently was on uh, Channel 4's dispatches. It was a uh, half hour long program and it looked at the plight of Amazon drivers. And interestingly enough, it was done through an online, there's an online campaign group, it's called uh, Organize, and you, it's rather like th 38 Degrees or Avaz, but it focuses on trade union issues. And they, the, the Channel 4 program rather underlines Nick's point, they used information provided by Organize and these Amazon drivers. They interviewed them anonymously, but that was one of the rare occasions I've seen a half hour programme looking at this problem. So it's happening, but as you say, it's marginal, it's min minute, and it's it's often very, very, um, it's, it hasn't got the impact we would want, it's like your report. Okay, thanks for that. Can we move on now to Jim? Jim Bumella 
Um, I've known Jim over the years through my activity in the NUJ, but Jim is also involved in the International Federation of Journalists. And um, I'm hoping that Jim can give us a, a more a broader perspective on this issue. So over to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Grantville, and good evening to everybody. Uh, many thanks for inviting me. And I would just start by spending a short time to contextualize what trade union journalists ever did for us. Scores, even hundreds of achievements that media freedom NGOs and many academic researchers, and never mind journalists, usually ignore. And what they don't, they dismiss them here and there. And a few days ago, UNESCO celebrated WordPress Freedom Day. And although most of the participants were on Zoom, there was an in-person celebration in Windhoek in Namibia. And for the first time in many years, UNESCO invited the International Federation of Journalists to be one of the core participants. This was quite a climb down on the part of UNESCO officials who have ignored trade unions for so long and elevated media freedom NGOs and corporations to be their chosen partners globally, and even governments, some of them pretty and savory and well-known backsliders and oppressors of journalists to be the ones leading the discourse on press and media freedom. And some of us are still trying to figure out why is this change of heart? And perhaps one of the most plausible explanations could be the COVID crisis and its impact on journalism and the role that trade union represented journalists have played globally to consolidate their mission to report timely, accurately, and crucial information in the fight against the pandemic the world over. And as we all know, many journalists worked under intolerable conditions where union had to fight bruising battles until authorities accepted journalists as key workers. And it is unions that have been negotiating the new working condition for journalists, their physical well-being and safety, as well as their economic survival, including financial packages for freelance journalists. And as well as the rich debate among journalists on the coverage, COVID has also opened up a space to discuss plans for the post-pandemic era for the media industry. And I'm glad that Media Reform Coalition and uh, CPBF North is part of this dynamic. All of the IFJ big unions worldwide have been with us for a long time. The IFJ itself is going to commemorate its centenary in a few years' time. So most of them have a long experience of standing up for journalists' rights, in many cases forged in the tradition and values of public service journalism. Over this year, the IFJ led a global public service broadcasting for all campaign, produced manifesto after manifesto, rallying journalists around public service values, which unions defended tooth and nails, pluralism and quality, ownership in public hands, and the management that is transparent, fairness at work, social justice, and rights protection for journalists and media workers. And one of the most important political fights has been about promoting models of financing for PSB and guarantees funding sufficient for needs and is protected for political and commercial interference. Here in the UK, many of us have in recent years been frustrated by the increasingly diminished role of the BBC and the pressure from the digital, mobile and platform dominated media environment. And it's easy to understand why people have so much frustration against the BBC today. However, we shouldn't forget why the action taken over the years by workers and their unions at the BBC continue to resonate the world over, making the BBC such a powerful model of PSB. And one of the best known, most powerful action has been the 24 hour strike against the ban of the real lives documentary that was a long time ago in 1985. And the issue in campaign by media unions who succeeded to lift the ban defeat Thatcher on this, and which continue to these days to be quoted and celebrated by many broadcasters as the best expression of union solidarity. We should, however, be sober in our evaluation that it didn't always work, as we have seen in the case of Greek uh, public service broadcaster, ERT, which was shut down by a left Greek government in 2013, bowing to the dictate of the banks after firing 2,500 workers, Journalists and media workers fought like hell, occupying the station, broadcasting online, and motivating the wider Greek labor movement to come out on a general strike. But it wasn't enough, and in the end, they got defeated. 
France has also been a country where journalists and media workers at France Television and France Radio have all often taken action over the years to defend their political, editorial, and strategic independence through industrial action. And they succeeded to motivate, on many instances, Parliament to defeat more than one disastrous government's plan. In countries where the political discourse is less confrontational, let's say, such as in Scandinavian countries, public radio and television remain non-profit and, and ad-free, thanks to the power of the unions to defend the license fee. Even when the defense of PSB is fought over in smaller outfits, not many have heard of, uh, such as the, a tiny Tunisian radio station, Sun FM, Shams FM, occupied by workers for over 80 days now to prevent its privatization. Or just a week ago, our small union in Namibia, the most recent to join the IFJ, mobilized over 200 journalists and media workers in an all-out strike at the Namibian public television led by young journalists who have never been in a union before. Everywhere you'll find the same mobilization, the same argument, and the same confidence to fight thanks to workers' organization. And at the same time, we've seen that when trade unions are weak or are culturally different, such as in Eastern Europe, they have been able to influence the establishment of credible PSBs. The new public service broadcasters in many countries were left to survive in the midst of what were once powerful state television. They had to sell airtime to advertisers and beg for Western donation. And they also had to survive a political onslaught almost everywhere. And I just cite two countries without going into detail, Poland and Hungary, where governments amended the law to take control of the public service broadcasters. Service, survey after survey have documented the role that can be played by trade union and how their collective action can help journalists and news organizations prevail when their freedom are under threat. But there are also a myriad of reports coming out of specialist organizations, such as, for example, the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalists. But in the end, they only advocate personal or interpersonal responses and make no effort to connect with workers' organizations which they dismiss as dinosaurs. But we all know that only trade unions have been capable to nurture solidarity among journalists and mobilize them to defend the public interest, nail corruption, and empower citizens. But since the onset of COVID, it is again the trade unions that have been at the forefront of lobbying for resources to save and protect jobs in the media industries and create a future that promotes a sustainable and ethical economy. The IFJ's global platform for quality journalism launched nearly a year ago included a shopping list ranging from taxing GAFAM, these are the uh, giant techs, to national media advertising programs, to stimulus funding, to revitalize staff newsroom and fund public service media, independent media, and national and local media not owned by multinationals. The NUJ, National Union of Journalists here, launched its own variant, the News Recovery Plan, including immediate short-term measures such as a windfall tax, financial package via future news fund, as well as medium term such as uh, uh, Journalism Foundation, recommended by the Can Cross Review, making local newspaper assets of community levels, reforming media ownerships and many other media. In the US, with this debate is even more advanced, the IFJ affiliate, the News Guild, launched its own Save the News campaign, which gave priority to demands to break up corporate ownership of news organizations, provide incentive for financial investors to sell news organizations to civic-minded local investors, as well as grants and tax credits for news organizations, while making sure that any additional money is spent in newsroom and spent to create jobs. John Schloes, the TNG president, made a few weeks ago a powerful submission to the Antitrust, Commercial and Administrative Law Subcommittee of Congress, focusing on how the withering of local news reached extinction level with 2,000 news deserts across the country. He spelled out the implication of over 2,000 US newsrooms that were shut down in the last 16 years. The revenue of newspapers falling 57% and 70% of advertising migrating to the internet at large and to major platforms in particular. He also spelled out what journalists 
now expect from Congress, including legislation to rein in the excessive power of Facebook and Google. And one of the most powerful demands is to force corporations to dedicate 60% of all revenues to new jobs and to seed in new startups in new desert. Finally, I was asked to include one or two points you might consider for the manifesto. I'm most interested to see how advocates for a public solution to the crisis continue to expand this debate, in particular following events in recent weeks in the US. There's still fierce argument among journalists surrounding state intervention, where many journalists in many countries oppose government meddling in the free press. But President Biden's recent economic plan started a new conversation as to what qualified for infrastructure. Is broadband infrastructure, and if it is, Surely, other key components of our information system, such as local journalism, must also qualify. We argue every day that journalism is a public good. And unions like TNG argue that all public goods, after all, require public investment. Some say that if we dedicate just 1% of the 4 trillion plus from the Biden economic plan to a federal fund for media, this will collect over $30 billion over the next 10 years, more than enough to save US journalists. Now, I will finish on this. There is at the same time another debate about the grants received from philanthropy, which have increasingly become central to the media survival landscape. I'm not just talking about comparatively small subsidies offered to local startups by family funds or by organizations like Luminate, but big money now offered by the tech giants. Facebook has pledged to invest $1 billion in the news industry globally over the next three years. In another initiative in response to the trend of financing email newsletters led by platforms like uh, Substack, Facebook also pledged last week to pay $5 million directly to local journalists. In this case, are we satisfied that this could be one of the new business models of the future, that corporate behemoths should be the ones directly shouldering the burden. Another crucial point to discuss. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Jim. My word, you, you covered some ground there uh, from the very specific national to what's going on in America. Uh, a very important debate that the, the, the media is part of the infrastructure. There's actually something uh, Jeremy Corbyn raised when he talked about trying to provide public broadband for people, part of an infrastructure. So we've got lots of issues. I'm just looking actually at some of the points that have been raised. Maybe we can look at what Patrick Harrington has raised. He talked about the point about Amazon and whether what can we learn from what happened at Amazon in Bessemer, Alabama, about how we organize unions and the media coverage of that. Um, that's one issue that's come up. Uh, the other issue I think that uh, I think we w need to look at, and you raised it, Jim, it's the, the notion of broadcasters. You referred to Eastern Europe and how they'd been weakened by their role as state broadcasters. A lot of the people think that's what's happening with the BBC um, in the way in which the Conservative uh, government is introducing new people onto the board and that maybe it erode its independence. So could we start maybe with, uh, and I'll start with Nicholas, what, what do you take, what's your take, Nick, on the Amazon in, in America? One or two people in the chat are saying they thought it was a negative, it was a defeat. I wrote a piece in the Morning Star which suggested it wasn't quite that. And in fact, there were very positive things that came out of it. Lessons to be learned. Nick, do you want to start with that and maybe come on to Sarah then? Yes, I would make the point that um, Sarah's just made, that um, the media do jump in on stories when you find that um, uh, the unions are taking on these great big international conglomerates, uh, you know, uh, 
Sarah with the Bakers Union was talking about what happened to uh, McDonald's when they staged a strike against them. She said even the right wing media piles in that he can't ignore it. And I think this is definitely the case with Amazon. You know, everybody in the country pretty well has got a connection as bought something via Amazon or as, as uh, getting a service from them. So we are interested in these big companies, just as we're interested in what's happening to Uber and to uh, Deliveroo. So I think you're right, uh, Granville, the fact that there was that coordinated, um, uh, uh, you know, that a coordinated campaign against Amazon in the US, that it, it was on that very central point of trade union recognition, which is at the heart of all of these issues, which is, you know, can the unions get a foothold? Yes, I think my own opinion is, um, I think we, we, we can learn from it and take encouragement from it, um, that even in the USA, um, the media jumped on the story. Sarah, do you want to come in on yeah. I, I would agree. We learn a hell of a lot from what's perceived from our losses. And yes, the, the recognition wasn't gained. Um, but actually, people are talking about the circumstances and the situation of those Amazon workers worldwide, which is very similar to, as to what happened with our strikers. You know, they went out on strike in McDonald's. People would think with the advertisements that are put out that McDonald's is a great place to work. But our members quite rightly were voicing actually no it isn't we didn't get recognition from that first strike but what we did get was wins for our workers locally because the bullying bosses in the in the stores were, were dismissed they got the biggest wage rise that they ever had because they were embarrassed by the media and people were starting to question actually mcdonald's isn't as good and as shiny and as golden as, as the yellow archers would have us think and that's the same now with Amazon. People are actually now looking in and, and believing those stories about people having to wee in bottles because they can't go get the breaks. Because that is the reality. Um, yes, they might not have won recognition, but what they've won is the support from 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 the globe. You know, we, we, we're all now talking about it. OK, thanks, Sarah. Um, I, d I just want to explore a little bit more. Um, when Nick made his introduction, he did focus on these small independent unions that are outside the TUZ. And in the chat, one or two people are saying that the big unions, I don't include the Baker's Union in this, by the way, uh, the big unions have massive bureaucracies and they don't put not, nearly enough effort into grassroots organising. Again, maybe this is one for Nick and you again. Is that the perspective? What's the relationship? How does the TUC see um, these upstart unions, if I can put them that, like that? So Nick first and then Sarah again. And I'm going to come into you, Jim, after that. Well, I think there's no doubt about it that um, the, the, the big unions are fighting recognition battles and... Uh, I think there are workers who are going unorganized, uh, as we've described, you know, unorganized groups of workers, which are very hard to reach. So my, my own my own uh, feeling is that uh, I, I get the sense that the TUC, perhaps collectively, there are people at Congress House who would like uh, to act, who would like to go over the head of the affiliates and try and find ways of bringing in workers. Uh, as I said, I mean, I was writing about the idea of having a sort of introductory offer, a one-stop uh, platform for zero hours workers where people, young people could sign up. Now, there are some organizations that are doing that. So I, I, I do feel, uh, and I go back, um, you know, I've got the scars on my back from reporting um, disputes. There's a famous uh, agreement uh, everybody should know about called the Bridlington, Bridlington Agreement that goes back donkey's years, um, which is all about um, how the TUC is trying to stop unions poaching one another as members. Now, it's a strength of the British Union movement that we have this independence and we have this rivalry. But I think in this very fast changing world of casual work and zero hours and flexible working, I think it can be a bit of an encumbrance. And I can't see any reason why, for example, um, you know, the Baker's Union have put up a very strong uh, case at McDonald's. I was writing about the Baker's Union fighting um, for recognition at um, McDonald's back in the 80s. Uh, you know, wh why isn't 
the bakers union why doesn't the union movement get behind the bakers union uh, and give them uh, a, a bit more solidarity and push so that's the point that i would make looking back on my time reporting i think the failure of the union movement has been to sort out this issue how best to recruit these these workers these precarious workers um in this sort of zero hours world which i'm afraid is going to get worse and worse okay sarah What's your take? I, I, I should put it out there that we have had a lot of solidarity, certainly in the last two or three years, from from some of the other unions, um, certainly some of the bigger ones organising in in the same sector. Um, but you're right; we we kind of focus on um, the same. There's, there's millions and millions of people that are working. That there's no trade union anywhere near where they are, and we do need to work on that. Um, we're definitely not as big as some of the other unions. And I think our kind of focus on McDonald's is what have we got to lose? We've only got to gain, you know. Um, they will try and swat us away like a little fly, like they've tried to do. But we're determined to be there and help and support those those people that are being exploited. Um, and we don't have the, the multiple levels of bureaucracy that bigger unions have because we, we, we're not that size. Um, I mean, we've got a lot of work to do going forward working together but places like Yorkshire Number TUC have done the the summer school um and the the kind of summer patrol sorry not summer school summer patrol where they were going out collectively as a as a as a TUC group of of different trade union activists talking to to workers and about trade unions and about their their rights at work and I think we need to build on things like that um getting our foot in the door and then looking at how to organize those workers but sheffield needs a pay rise if if anybody's watching and you've not had any involvement or seen anything around that please have a look at the work that they are doing because it's phenomenal community organizing and workplace organizing across the trade union movement in sheffield thanks sarah jim uh, over to you on this business of um looking at one of the themes that is part of the media reform coalition project on what do we mean by public service media what's your take on what is happening at the bbc and how can we a lot of trade unionists and i found this during the last election became very critical of the bbc so what's your take on this the criticism that the bbc is uh being vulnerable to if you want to this sort of influence from the conservative right Unmute. You need to unmute. Thanks very much, uh, Granville. Would you allow me just to say a couple of words about the debate that just took place now? Because I've been very frustrated that I couldn't get in. I, I, I think okay. it's not terribly productive, really, to to. Uh, uh, you know, to, to, to try to set, you know, what you call the startup unions, you know, against the uh, traditional organized labor movement. Uh, uh, you know, because if, if you look at what's happening worldwide, I, I mentioned the, the Namibian. The, the Namibian union was formed only, I don't know, a few months ago. They haven't even got a registration, which means they're not allowed really kind of to, uh, to, uh, to represent workers there. And they set up, these are people who never belong to trade union, and they li linked up to the organization, organization of the labor movement in Africa. They're, they're, they're linked up to the African TUC, they're linked up you know, to the IFJ, and it's that solidarity that gives them the strength to do what they did. And, and the startups, you know, they, they do exist within kind of uh, big countries and big unions. Only recently in the newspaper guild, they had a huge campaign of strike at the New Yorker, but at, at plenty of kind of new media trying to organize kind of a new union. So, so it, it is not happening just by, you know, group of people, you know, uh, organizing themselves, you know, to, to take, take up their right. That's very important, but you shouldn't counterpose it, you know, to what the labor movement that is very well organized and has a tradition of organization is capable of achieving. Now, let, let me come to the question that you asked. I mean, I, I did uh, try it in the small time that they had, and it's very complicated things. 
uh, you know, trying to explain, you know, that whenever you've got trade union organized in a public service broadcaster, you know, workers are doing better. Workers have fought, not only for their rights, but they've fought for the public service value. And that, I think, is very easy, is a kind of to forget and think that is not important. That tradition of public service value, because that, the campaign that the IFJ had for about 20 years, and they tried, you know, to influence what has happened in Eastern Europe, where the, 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 the big kind of television were moving on from being state television, hoping they become public service. And they did it on the back of what has been achieved elsewhere. That's, that's why I, I put it, and I, I was not exaggerating, you know, how people view the, the BBC workers and the BBC union and the BBC in general. You know, uh, those nuances that we, and we've got today in terms of the, the, the slides, you know, uh, uh, down the drain under the pressure that is taking place, a lot of people elsewhere do not see it that way. When you, when you can compare what's happening at the BBC today to what's happening, you know, in Poland, you know, what's happening in Azerbaijan, what's happening in the whole of the Arab world, then we can spend, you know, a whole fortnight talking about what's happening in the public sector, you know, in the Arab world or in Africa. And you can see the, the difference. Now, that is not to say that we shouldn't take seriously the pressure that is taking place, uh, which again, it's because the, the license fee has got, you know, uh, in the hands, of course, of government that determined this, you know, has got it, it's kind of, it's, it's the wrong side that you are in the hands of politicians and you have to fight. At the end of the day is the ability of whether we can mobilize the, the union members inside the BBC to fight for this question. They have been fighting, you know, for many years, as, as you know, granted on issues of gratitude and issues and also on ideological issues. And, and yeah. the question is whether that, 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 that strength is still there. And if it's not there and if it weakens, how we should mobilize it and motivate it so it's there again. And you will be surprised that you will come back again, you know, because that fight is not in the hand of the bureaucrat that sits around, you know, kind of the management of the BBC. It's been, it's always been in the hands of, uh, of the journalists and the media workers and their unions. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and thanks for coming back on the, uh, on the, on the issue I raised also of the smaller unions that are coming in. We're getting in the chat that one or two, this is one I think is interesting. The fight for workers' rights are universally compelling stories. The reason the mainstream media don't cover them enough is that they're not, I was just, they're, it, is that they're, it's just ideological. How can unions learn to sell their stories to legacy outlets? Now, you, uh, Nick, you, you, you've had experience of all of this in the BBC. How do we try to get these messages across the mainstream media. You've argued that some of it's been done through the smaller unions that have been set up. But what's, are there problems now structurally in places like the BBC or Channel 4 to get these stories spaced on the airwaves? The, um, yes, I think there's been a historic sort of change. I mean, what happened in the 80s was quite significant because, of course, we, we, we moved to the whole idea of sort of popular capitalism. Um, you know, unions were no longer needed. Um, that was the sort of the message that came out of the of the Thatcher decade. And it has got into newsrooms that there's almost a, a sort of, I think you're right, almost an ideological bar um, to l looking at the, the, the plight of workers. Now, Sarah's explained it very, very clearly. I mean, there you've had stories about, as she says, food workers who um, are having to share homes and cars, uh, they have high rates of, um, of COVID, yet the newspapers aren't looking behind it, they're just blaming them rather than looking at the, at the reasons. And, and that, that indictment um, of, of, of journalism and especially of 
uh, people like me, um, w well, we haven't got any Labour correspondents. I mean, I wrote a book about the failure <laughs> of the media to employ uh, journalists specialising in Labour and industrial affairs. So where we go from here is, I mean, I think that it would be fascinating, you see, if, if uh, and, I, and I accept uh, the Baker's Union has small resources, but that's a very uh, uh, telling point, isn't it, about um, workers uh, in, in food industry and how how they have had higher rates of COVID because of the of poverty. Now that that is beginning to be heard as a wider message. But um, what I think the challenge for the trade union movement is, and I notice this in stories after stories, first of all, the media, the journalism, doesn't have the journalists who are doing the basic legwork uh, of, you know, assessing what's happened. And I think there's more responsibility on unions to come up with original research. Now, um, I, I know that uh, the Baker's Union is, you know, strapped for cash and strapped for people, but some more detailed information. I think if, if, if there were more details, facts and figures coming out um, of the union movement um, about low pay, about exploitation, that were properly resourced uh, information, I think it would, it would break through because I think there is an appetite out there in the media. So my, my, my only hope uh, is that the union movement will somehow um, concentrate a little bit more on getting information out to the media in a way that's not happening at the moment. Sarah, do you want to come back on this one? Yeah, if I can, just very quickly. Um, we have done a report. We've done a right to food report. Please excuse my um, black and white copy. But that is based on our members telling us how they've, how they've struggled through COVID to feed themselves, feed their families. It's real life stories. And that's what we're getting out there. You know, it's, it's disgusting in the, the sixth richest country in the world that the people producing the food to feed the nation through a pandemic can't even feed themselves and their families. One in five were relying on friends and family to provide food so that they could they could feed themselves. That's wrong. And that's that's something that we're now trying to get out. You know, I, I mentioned that the Guardian have picked it up. Of course, we've got the, the lights of the Morning Star that are running things out for us because they're, they're, they work with us on a regular basis. But other news streams haven't picked that up. It's not sexy enough for them, for, for people starving yet filling the shelves of supermarkets and, and our bellies. Um, and it is frustrating. And we are a small union, but... We have taken the time to speak to our members and, and produce a report that we want to get out as far as and as wide as we can. And now the next steps are how do we change that? Because it's OK having a really good report that says how crap things are. But now our next steps are. So what do we do to change our industry? Um, and, and we will continue to, to, to shout from the rooftops about the lack of investment our industry has. It's just we need the media to help us get that message out further. Um, and not just relying on social media and a few left-wing newspapers. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, I just want to go to another question in the chat. Um, and it's, it says, it seems to me that many young people don't understand what a union does. Now, one of the things about the Amazon Bessemer case, which I thought was striking, there's a really excellent uh, uh, US reporter called Mike Elk. He runs Payday Report. And Mike interviewed some of the people who voted against the union. And what the thread that ran through his comments from these people was that they didn't know what unions were. They, and now, I find that incredible in one sense, but this, this was amongst younger people who have not been used to what some of us, oldies, have been used to, which was always there's been a union presence in the places that we've been working. So what about that point? Maybe go to Jim first. How do we educate young people about what unions do and what their benefit is? It's rather like the questions, what have the Romans ever done for us? What have the unions ever done for us? Jim? Yeah, thanks, Grandpa. Uh, I don't take lightly, you know, the, the when people say, uh, I don't know how to join a union, uh, in particular, kind of when they're young and forced, there is a challenge there. I can only talk from inside the union uh, and in, inside of my, my union, the National Union of Journalists, that, you know, the, the issue 
of young entrants in journalism is a very big issue. It's not an issue that, that has been ignored. In fact, for many years now, there have been so many initiatives, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to kind of to, uh, you know, to uh, to connect, you know, with uh, young entrants in journalism. And, and you know that very well, Granville, even for students in journalism, this has been like one of the main day-to-day uh, -day initiative, you know, operation of the union since, I don't know, 20, 30 years, perhaps more, you know, to, uh, to recruit and give uh, a special status Sorry. to uh, young people that just, you know, put a, a foot in the door of journalism at journalism school. Can I just say, uh, we, we are taking a, a, maybe a part of this debate, looking at things happening here in the UK, but, uh, you, know, uh, you know, journalism, particularly talking about uh, this my particular profession and industry, is like many other industries, the universal one. And, and, and you have to look at it from that point of view. Uh, the IFJ did um, survey after survey of young people, and, and, and uh, one of the most kind of very, very strong kind of uh, out, uh, you know, input and come back you know, from talking within unions in many countries, whether the, 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 the journalist union are young unions. When you look at the percentage, of young people inside those unions, you know, just give you an indication that those unions have been reasonably successful, you know, in in bringing in and recruiting, uh, you know, kind of young journalists in many countries. And you will be surprised to see how many of them, you know, uh, today bring young people among their delegation conferences and part of the many debates that are taking place. So. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, there are surveys, and I don't think that we should just, we, we shouldn't be pushed towards just leaning on anecdotal evidence and what's happened when we talk to somebody. So what, what people tell us, you know, that feedback is very important. We should take it on board. But we shouldn't take it, you know, in as much as to generalize it and explain what's happening within the trade union movement. Thanks, Jim. Now, uh, I'm looking at, we, we're coming towards the end of this session now. Um, we, we've touched on a number of issues, but I wanted to give all of the speakers some time before we finish, to, if there are any things that we need to focus on that I haven't raised with you or people haven't raised in the chat. But uh, there's one issue that I think um, wor is worth discussing, and that is how do we start and you, you hinted at it, Sarah, and when you talk about Sheffield needs a pay rise, where you begin to link together both the union and the community. So that's one issue. How do we try to build those sorts of links? The second issue, and it's one that I think it's raised partly implicitly in your report, Sarah, that you, you, you couldn't get the your report about the kind of uh, conditions that workers had faced during the pandemic into the media. But what about social media? How how do we start to use social media? So there's two questions there. One, is there a role for social media separate from the structures traditionally we've used, print, press, broadcasting, social media? And secondly, what role, and this is something that happened with Amazon, or we think it did, Amazon in Bessemer, where there were links made between unions and communities. So maybe we could have a response from people. Do you, Nick, do you want to come in on this first? And then Sarah and then Jim. I think you're quite right um, about the challenges of, of social media and, and what more can be done. I mean, I've been struck. Um, I started off as a local newspaper reporter in the 60s, of course, and the whole sort of, you know, journalistic structure has, has, has disappeared. Um, and, you know, in the old days, I would be going around and talking to local union representatives. Well, that that, that, that era has gone, uh, but social media does give um, a tremendous platform. And I think what what needs to be done is 
Um, and I think it's, you know, the responsibility of, of, of old journalists like myself um, is that we should try to do more um, to help the next generation get online, to get their work published. Um, that's what I would hope um, campaigners and, and campaigners would do, uh, that we could do some some more to get, get this information out. You see, if you take Sarah's case with all of the case histories that she's got in her union, now the, the task of trying to humanize these case histories and get them out online i mean that that's a real challenge but it would be i think very very productive if you if you could do that so i think the social media platform is is there to be exploited um by the trade union movement and what the trade union movement needs to do is to understand you know how can it use these human interest stories and get them out online and get them that wider audience because um, i i think there is the audience for them so it's it's a bit of a challenge. I mean, we you know we uh, Jim was talking about the question of the startup unions and the suggestion that somehow I'm, you know, counterposing a startup union against the big unions. I, I'm not saying that. I'm I'm just talking about the reality of the position, which is I'm looking back on 40 years, um, you know, l looking at employment and trade union affairs, and they're seen now to be more. Uh, independent unions raising their profiles than they were uh, 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 several years ago, several decades ago. So that's a phenomenon that's happening. A lot of them understand how, because of course they've got a much younger mobile um, uh, group of people, they understand better perhaps how to use social media than some of the established unions. And that again is, is a challenge to the established trade union movement. So I think there's a lot we can do, uh, as a lot that former journalists like myself can do, to bring on a new generation and to help people and advise them how to present this information in a way that is going to appeal to the mainstream media. Sarah? Um, I think we've got to utilise um, every aspect of the toolbox, haven't we? We've, any t Zoom and, and platforms such as this have allowed us to continue to operate and reach out more people than we ever could during a global pandemic. And you've got to only look at the NEU and how many th tens of thousands of people they were having on meetings. It, it's just phenomenal. It's the largest trade union meeting ever they've had during a global pandemic. Um, so social media, digital platforms like this, we've got to utilise. We've got to be pulled into the 21st century. You know, I, I, I'm quite embarrassed to admit, had it not been for a global pandemic, we probably wouldn't have utilised Zoom for for years as a trade union because we wouldn't have seen the need to do it and it shouldn't replace face-to-face -face talking and organizing but it, it's it's going to be an addition to so social media definitely has its place going forward we've seen the power that it can that it can um have um and we've got to utilize it building links between workers and community is it's a given isn't it people don't understand what trade unions are they think that it's just these random tube drivers that go out on strike in London and, and stop the whole of London from moving. They don't necessarily see that actually what we do is we campaign for, for environmental issues and, and for our communities to be greener. We support um, campaigns around sexual harassment and violence and domestic violence. And there's, we don't just, trade unions aren't just for the workplace. People's issues don't just stop at the door when they when they finish work. And they also don't, the, the, the personal issues don't just stop at the door when they enter the workplace. We've got to have a wholesome approach and we've got to utilise links in the community to make sure we're reaching out as many people as possible. And just on young people, one thing we found when we were organising McDonald's workers is we were learning as much from McDonald's workers as they were learning for, from us about what a trade union was. And we didn't go into those workplaces and say, hey, look, we're the Baker's Union, we're going to come and save the day. We went into those workplaces and said, are you annoyed? Not always using the word annoyed, but are you annoyed that the, the CEO of your company is earning £5,000 an hour and you're struggling to make ends meet? And if they said yes, right, then what are you going to do about it in your workplace? You have the power as the collective here. We need to change that narrative that the, the trade unions aren't. We're not a third party. 
I am not the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union as a general secretary. Our membership is the Baker's Food and Allied Workers Union, and they are powerful when they come together in the workplace, locally, regionally, and nationally. And getting that message out that people are powerful when they stand together is what we need to do. And learning from young people, you know, I've not, I've not had to work on a zero hours contract. I can't even begin to imagine what that must be like. But there are young people out there that are that I can learn from, from and and then develop and help them to organise in their workplace. So it's got to be a two way process. It's got to be a two way conversation. Um, and not having trade unions in education certainly doesn't help. We've done, um, I know Unite do a lot around going into schools, but certainly we've done some things working with universities going into the employability week to talk about the importance of trade unions, asking people what they're doing on the Saturday jobs if there's an issue and, and, and raising questions like that. So we've not got all the answers. We're a world away from where we need to be, but we're definitely on the right track. Um, and it's just, we've just got to get people's vision of trade unions being these big rich bosses sat in ivory towers out of their heads because they're not the trade union the people on the shop floor are the ones that are struggling day to day to feed themselves and the families and dealing with exploitative bosses they're the trade union and they're the movement that needs global support great stuff thanks sarah final word to you jim well i i i want to come back you know to this question of um you know whether the stories whether there were enough stories told um, if you take the pandemics, for example, about the impact of pandemics and workers. And, and when the, the history of uh, 2020 um, 20 and 2019 is written, uh, historian will have a treasure trove. There are hundreds of thousands, millions of stories. I mean, if you take what's happening today in India, and if you go and see what the media is saying about, uh, you know, the, the tragedy that is taking place, there's so many uh, individual stories, you know, of, of uh, uh, not only of what's happening to real people and their families, but also to, to what's happened to workers. So I don't think we, we, we should, it would be wrong to, 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 to minimize the effort that has been done by, by journalists uh, uh, to tell the story of people and the impact uh, of, of the pandemic. Uh, on the question of the link up with communities, uh, you, you're quite right, Grandpa, to, to raise it. And uh, apart from that specialized debate that's taken place among journalists about the future of journalism, certainly the question of uh, how to resolve the uh, issue of uh, news desert that is happening not everywhere, but certainly in, in many countries, the United States is one of them. Uh, you know, the uh, the, 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 the way forward is part of the solution that has been put on the table of how to, you know, reimagine, you know, that, that news desert. What needs to be done in terms of building community media organizations, how to fund them. And that is why uh, in my presentation, uh, I try to go a bit further than the, the current kind of solution, which is just to get money from eBay or from, you know, or from Facebook, you know, that throw money on the, uh, because they, they, they know that they, the only way for them to get themselves out of the, you know, the kind of the trouble that they're in at the moment. So we have to be much more imaginative to see how we're going to receive those communities. Uh, what is the best business model for them? And those communities by themselves are going to be connected to local communities. Uh, the, 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 the local media is going to be like the, 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 our local newspapers and broadcasting has always been linked to the local uh, media and our, our, our structures. You know, there is nobody yeah. more powerful than our own branches that the NUJ has got in the same way, the rest of the labor movement have got their own kind of uh, local presence and they link up with what's happening locally. But we do, we do play a big role in pulling people together, in fighting on, on the best issues of the day. And even when the local newspapers or media are a bit slow in catching up, you know, the activists within the union make sure that that catching up is being done. 
So let's not forget, uh, you know, let's look at the positive side that our yeah. structures and the weapons that we've got are quite strong. Even if from time to time there are gaps and, and we have to put a lot of efforts in order kind of to reconnect everything, we can do it because that is very much the, the nature of our organizations. Good. That's a good note to finish on. Just let me uh, emphasize, I'm very optimistic about the prospect for us being able as trade unionists to get our message across into the media. We've got great stories, powerful stories to tell. And when Jim mentioned um, the, the, the links between the NUJ and communities, certainly I, I'm very aware that the branch I'm a member of, uh, Wakefield and West Yorkshire, sorry, Leeds and Wakefield, Leeds, Wakefield, West Yorkshire, um, it, it's begun to realise that journalists have got to get their message out there to the politicians, to the communities. They've got to do that about the plight and threats to local and regional journalism. So I'm very optimistic about it. And I think we've got a challenge on our hands. But um, I'd like to thank all, all of you, please, for your contributions, all being very relevant and focused and I'll end on just one note a plug Nick is going to write a piece for Media North the summer issue on some of the topics he's raised so I look forward to reading it Nick and thank you again first of all the Media Reform Coalition for working with Media North on putting this event on I hope you found it interesting and informative and please get in touch with us you can find Media North on our website and you're, of course, going to get a little plug for the Media Reform Coalition now. OK, thank you ever so much, everybody. Over and out. Bye-bye.